personally apologize for no snow. I'm sorry about that. I feel like I'm kind of the authority here this morning. I've got to say something. I don't know why. I mean, Wednesday, we were all jacked up, right? It was like 100%, 90% chance of snow. Everyone was pumped. Thursday, 60%. Friday, 30%. Saturday, I was in my backyard just praying for a flake. <laughs> Come on, just one. And now you're stuck with me this morning. Sorry about that. So, well, hey, welcome back to our series in the, the New Testament book of 1 John. Do me a favor, if you haven't already, please open your Bibles or Bible apps to 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5. Uh, if you want um, to go a little more in depth, or I should say have more of my notes available to you, you can get on your, your Bible app and go to events, and you'll see the New Heights events, and you can click on that, and more of my notes are there for your disposal. Well, last week, Kevin talked about overcoming the world, but he said the only way we can do that is through Jesus. And I thought this morning, it's, it's, it's really important for us, especially as we get into verse 13, to understand what our relationship is with Jesus in verses 11 and 12. And so I wanted to kind of springboard before we springboard into verse 13, I want to do some review in verses 11 and 12. So do me a favor, look at verse 11 this morning. John says, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Now mind you, this is 85, 90 year old, most scholars tell us, um, Apostle John. He is in his, his grandfatherly shepherding stage of his life. He's no longer the young one that ran to the tomb. He's the old one shepherding uh, God's children throughout the region. He's on the island, very rough, rustic, wind-blown island of Patmos. And he's writing by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And John says, and this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life. And, and this life is in his son. Verse 11 starts with the phrase, and this is our testimony. And that raises the question, what is our testimony of Jesus? And we don't get to, to ponder that for long because Jesus, uh, John answers it pretty quickly. He says our testimony is that God has given us eternal life and that life is in his son. And this is, this is really important for us to understand because Kevin mentioned it last week, but we need to know this, is that Christianity is not just for dead people. Christianity doesn't just begin the day our lives end. Eternal life doesn't start on the day we die, but on the day that we meet Jesus. Please write this down. This is really important. I want you to see this. Eternal life is a duration of life. It is. But it's also a quality of life. It's also a quality of life. It's not just us going to heaven, but it's Holy Spirit bringing heaven down to us. And this is really important to grasp because one of the reasons I think that young people today are so discouraged about Christianity it's because that they think it's only something that kicks in when you die. So when we tell the average 16-year-old, when you die, you'll get to go to heaven, here's what they say. Great. Great. In 60 years, I'll think about it. Between now and then, I'm going to live my life. I'm going to do my thing. And I think one of the reasons for that is we have done such a bad job of talking about life now in in our, in our walk with Jesus. The goal is not to go to heaven, but the goal is to be with Jesus. A, a bunch of people believe in heaven that don't believe in Jesus. Did you know that? There's like, there's like millions of people that believe in an afterlife, believe in, in eternity, believe in heaven, but they don't believe in Jesus. And John is saying in verse 11 that there is no heaven, there is no eternal life, Without Jesus, eternal life begins with Jesus and it starts when we first embrace him, meet him as Savior and Lord. Let me ask you, and I want you, you can answer this. How many of you in this room, would your life be different and not better if you didn't meet Jesus? Raise your hand. Your life would be different and not better if you didn't meet Jesus. Knowing Jesus doesn't just change our future but it radically impacts our life right now. Remember what, what Jesus said in, in John chapter 10. This is really important. Most of us have read this, 
these verses, but we don't really think about it. John, quoting Jesus, says in John chapter 10, verse 9, he says, Jesus says, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out. Now, these next three words, you don't think about these very often, do you? And find pasture. You say, well, what's pasture? Food, peace, serenity, safety. Jesus says, when you enter in my gate, that's what you find. Like right now. In this moment. Well, what kind of gate does the world offer? What does the devil offer? Verse 10, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, whoa, whoa, hold on, Lee. There's lots of people that don't know Jesus, man. They're living life. Like the Bible even says sin is fun for a season. For a season. Because I've been there. Because I grew up in it. Both sides of my family, mom's side, dad's side. Here, here is what my unbelieving family and what I experienced is perpetual tension, perpetual nervousness, perpetual fear, and you never quite feel fulfilled. Like you don't know how to say it, but Solomon said it well. God has put eternity in our hearts. So Jesus says this, I have come that they may have life and, and have it to the full. I mean, like right now. So some of you are going, well, man, I'm not feeling that. That's a you problem. I, want us to, I really want us to get this. Jesus said in John chapter 14, I, I'm going to leave. But don't, don't, don't worry about it because I'm going to leave you the Holy Spirit. I'm going to leave, perfect for Christmas season, right? God in you. Like, just say it to yourself quietly. You don't have to say it to your neighbor. I'll make you do Like, God lives inside of me. The hope of glory lives inside of me. Supernatural resurrection dynamite lives inside of me. And so often we're doing this. Yeah, I guess. And so your average 7-year-old, 17-year-old, 27-year-old goes, oh, wow. I guess Christianity's for dead people. Call me in 40 years on my deathbed. It's amazing. Like we don't live like it and then we get mad at God. We don't claim that supernatural power. We say, God, where are you? It's not just about dying and going to heaven. But it's about having eternal life like right now. And practically over time, it it looks like this. You ready? I didn't put it up on the board, but I'm going to say it. We meet Jesus. And then as we grow in Jesus, we call that sanctification, it gets better and better and better, and then we die, and it's the best. But there's a whole lot of getting better along the way. So the question now is this. How how do we know if we have eternal life? Verse 12. It's so simple. (laughs) We make it so complicated, which the devil loves to do, right? Whoever has the Son has life. Do you believe in Jesus? Do you trust in Jesus? Do you love Jesus? Do you belong to Jesus? Genesis to Revelation, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. You say, man, you guys get up tight when when people mess with the cross. Yeah, because it's about Jesus. You get a little tense when people... Mess with the incarnate. Yeah, it's about Jesus. You know, when, when people are not sure about the resurrection, you seem to get upset. Yeah, because it's about Jesus. It's Jesus. There are certain things in the Bible that are, are hard to understand, but the rest of verse 12 is not one of them. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. That's pretty straightforward. We have Jesus, we have eternal life. We don't have Jesus, we don't have eternal life. And that's really the whole reason that John wrote the book, the letter of 1 John. We'll talk more about that in a few minutes. But that that leads us to our our text this morning. And so John is going to point out two things that are really important for us to know, really encouraging for us to know as as followers of Jesus Christ, as, as a son and as a daughter of Jesus Christ. He wants us To know these two things all the time. Number one, he says this. Because you know and love me, 
you can know that you have eternal life. You can know. Now think about that. How fulfilling, how abundant. Jesus says in John 10, 10, I've come to give you a a life full, an abundant life. How abundant would your life be if you're always worried about whether or not you're going to go to heaven? Can you imagine? I'm a believer. I'm a, but I'm not sure. Not, but who knows? I, I am, but I don't, maybe. I'm going to heaven, hopefully. So verse 13, John says this, I write these things. The first 12 verses of 1 John 5, but really most scholars think the entire book. I, I write these things that, that you may believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. He uses that word know 39 times in the book, nine times in in 1 John 5 alone. I really want you to know this. John tells us that he wants us to know that we have eternal life, and, and this is nothing new for John. You may recall at the end of his gospel, he says this, John chapter 20 and verse 31, but these are written, sound familiar? That you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Paul began his letter to the Ephesians with these words. Some of my favorite, some of my favorite verses. And you also were included in Christ, Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 13, when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, when you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 12, at the end of his life, he says, this is why I am suffering as I am, yet this is no cause for shame because I know whom I have believed and I'm convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 7, Paul continues, he's at the end of his life and he says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. By the way, wouldn't you like to say that? Wouldn't you like to say that? You're like, man, Paul, you're kind of (laughs) cocky. He's done it. He's lived it out. Now, there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. He's pretty sure. Right? There's no ambivalence here. And not only to me, praise God, but to also to all who have longed for his appearing. Peter wrote in 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 10, Therefore, in light of the first nine verses, my brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election, for if you do these things, you will never stumble, and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Peter wanted us to know that we have eternal life. John wrote this letter not so we could hope that we have eternal life. He didn't write this letter so we could be pretty sure that we have eternal life. He wrote it so we can know that we have eternal life. So, in order to gain this assurance, we must clearly identify not only what assurance of salvation is, but what it is not. So two things that it it is not. And I want to walk through these quickly. Assurance of salvation is not anchored to our emotions. It is not anchored to our emotions. You say, whoa, whoa, hold on, Lee. Dude, you're an emotional guy. Like, I feel sorry for Ruth. You're so emotional. You're just emotional. I am an emotional guy. I am. I love emotions. Um, But it's not about whether we feel saved or feel good about our chances or even having a sense of peace about things. Emotions um, are undependable and are often misguided. A person may feel they are a good singer. But reality is a bear, isn't it? (laughs) You know that too. You're like, I can sing good. You're in the shower. And your voice box, it fools you. It sends a different voice to your mind. You know that, right? Like right now, as I speak, I think I sound a certain way, but to you guys, it's just Jerry Seinfeld the whole time. That's all it is. You're crazy. What are you talking about, Jerry? That's all you hear. I hear the voice of God. You hear Jerry Seinfeld. That's all you hear. You go from the shower to your car to your folding chair in the gym, and you're like, I got it. I'm pretty good. 
And everyone else is going, mm, not so much. Some of you think you're really funny. <laughs> right? You're like, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a funny guy. I, I mean, I, I, really, I really am. Um, but actually, you're just annoying. So <laughs> emotions are inconsistent and unreliable. When I became a Christian, so did my two uh, running buddies, Mike and Carson. And believe it or not, as emotional as I can be, if you really know me, uh, initially, I'm almost always a skeptic. Like, I, I just took the Berkman test. Anyone take the Berkman? Yeah, and so I by two other people, wow. And so um, I took the Berkman, and I surprised people on two levels. One, I'm, I'm really emotional, and I'm all there, but I'm actually a skeptic. And two, I'm an extrovert, but I get recharged by being alone. Like, just throws people off. And so um, I, I'm a skeptic at heart. And so when m myself and my, my buddy Mike and my buddy Carson, when we came to know Jesus, I was, I was the skeptic in the group. But once I believe, I'm all in. So when Mike and Carson and I became believers, I, I was the skeptic. Carson was the, the quiet, emotional researcher, the engineer. And Mike, oh man, you'd love Mike. Mike was, um, was emotional. He was super happy. He was easygoing. He embraced everything from this. Carson and I, not so much. But Mike, man, he was all in. Like, if you would align the three of us up, after we received Christ, you'd be like, Mike, most likely to succeed. Most likely to keep walking with Jesus. So, three years go by. We're now 19, 20 years old. And uh, we've graduated from high school. We're in our first, coming back from our first year in college. And uh, I come back and I'm hanging out at my local church. And Karsten is there. And we're both like, hey, where's Mike? Where's Mike at? So we go talk to his mom. And his mom's like, yeah. He came from a better family than Carson. And I came from totally unbelieving families. But I came from a good family. I'm like, she says, yeah, he's not doing too good. Here's his phone number. Here's his apartment address. And so we call him. He doesn't pick up. And, you know, back in the day, before cell phones and everything else, you just drove a lot. So we just drove over to his apartment and uh, kind of had an intervention. We didn't know it was going to be an intervention. He just wouldn't, wouldn't return our call. See his car out front. We show up to his apartment. He's living with a bunch of guys. He's there alone. And uh, we walk in, and immediately you're like, okay, this doesn't smell right, and this doesn't look right. And then Mike doesn't look right. We're like, what happened? So we start talking, hey, man, bro, we miss you. What's going on? How's you, what's Jesus doing in your life? And then Mike looks at us, and he pauses. And he says these words. Uh, huh, guys, it was this thing called salvation. It was an emotional thing I did as a teenager. I don't consider myself a Christian anymore. Now, myself and Carson, the skeptic and the non-emotional researcher, 36 years later, we're both pastors and still madly in love with Jesus. Emotions aren't bad, but assurance of salvation is not anchored to our emotions. Secondly, our assurance of salvation, it, it's not anchored to our experience. Again, let me say, I'm emotional. And when I chose to follow Jesus at 17, it was an amazing experience. But my assurance of salvation is not tied back to whether or not I had a certain experience. Some people lack assurance because their experience was different from somebody else. You know, they didn't, they didn't walk an aisle. They didn't weep. They didn't feel something strange. They didn't go to the third heaven, whatever, right? Write this down in your mind. You can actually write it down yourself. As a follower of Jesus, do not get experience envy. Everybody's different. Every, some of you in this room, like your mom and dad, they lovingly, they prayed for you. And then at whatever age, they shared the gospel with you. Maybe they read to you the, the Jesus Bible story. And you're like, I think I'm ready. And they're like, praise God. And they prayed with you and you received Christ. And it wasn't some massive, you, didn't, you, 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 you weren't coming from drugs and alcohol and, and a life of promiscuity. 
the Holy Spirit took the life of your parents and the Word of God and convicted you and you, praise God, hallelujah. You don't need to have like a whiskey bottle in your testimony to be a Christian, right? You don't have to have some crazy dysfunctional story and you're like, oh man, dude, I, I was like rescued from, you know, like terrorists and it was crazy. You don't need that. Don't get experience envy. People are different and people's experiences are different. Our assurance of heaven, and I want you to write this down, I'm going to put it on the screen behind me, is not anchored to our experience. Our assurance of heaven is found and anchored to God's word. And we have assurance because we believe in Jesus, period. Period. God has promised that those who believe on the Lord Jesus Christ will be saved. The Bible doesn't say that we might be saved. It says that we will be saved. John chapter 3 and verse 16 doesn't say that we might have eternal life. It says that whoever believes on him will not perish and will have eternal life. Our assurance rests on him, not us. So the question is this. You say, well, Kaylee, that's great, but, but how do we know if we have believed? This is why John wrote the book. This is the whole letter. He wants us to to walk in power and strength. He doesn't want us to walk in fear. He wants us to to walk with assurance. And so if you look in the the gospel of, of, the book of 1 John, pardon me, and go through the whole thing, there are three significant truths that come out constantly. And if those things aren't in our life, we better check. Do I really know Jesus? But if we really know Jesus, these three things will be in our life. Now, to what degree? It changes with every person. But I want to walk you quickly through these three things. If, if we really are a follower of Jesus, these three things from, from 1 John will have taken place in our life. Number one, and this is a given, we've trusted in Jesus alone. Not Jesus plus. Not Jesus plus works. Not Jesus plus tradition. Not Jesus plus, hey, I'm a really good person coming from a good family. Jesus says, I am the atoning sacrifice, me and me alone. Number two, we'll see this. This is another theme. You know this. It's convicting. We must be growing in our love for God and for others. I would encourage you, as we've gone through this book, and we're kind of wrapping it up here in the next few weeks, go back and look at all those times it says, if you don't love your brother or your sister, you don't love me. You don't know me. You're not walking in me. Now, it doesn't mean you don't have a temporary mistake or a temporary fallout. We'll talk more about that later. It just means that the pattern of your life is, I hate so-and-so, but I love God, and God gets it. No, he doesn't. He doesn't get it. He doesn't understand it. Because if you have the love of the Father in you, if you have Holy Spirit living inside of you, you have perfect love coursing through your veins, how can you hate your brother? You can't. Number three, we see this time and time again. This is a given. We should be making progress in obedience. Obedience doesn't become a labor. It becomes a joy. Time and time again, he says these words, obey my commandments. But then he adds this, which is really interesting. He says, they're not a burden. See, if you're trying to earn your way to, to heaven through keeping the commandments, they're a burden. You're like, oh, the 632 of these, and oh man, and if you believe the, the rabbis who interpreted the 632, there's 4,000 more, and oh man, I can't do it. You can't. Once again, when the Holy Spirit lives inside of you, you go, man, these aren't a burden, they're a blessing. I get to love my brother. I get to give. I get to serve. I get to be pure. I can be holy. They're not a burden, they're a blessing. Okay, I know what you're thinking. I can read your mind right now. Lee, what about those, those people who for long periods of time say that they're Christians, but they don't live like it? Like I got this aunt, man, oh man, she crazy. She, just, she said she prayed a prayer uh, when she was seven, and now she's 47, and, and she's like worshiping Satan. Is she a believer? I would say what the Bible says for people who say that. 
if we know Jesus as Savior and Lord, if Holy Spirit lives inside of us, there will be fruit, spiritual fruit in our lives. And so very lovingly, we do fruit inspection. You say, well, what's fruit inspection? We talked about it a couple weeks ago. In that person's life, do you see love, agape love, choice love, unconditional love? Do you see joy? How about peace? Do you see forbearance and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and, and self Do you see this fruit in their, in their lives? Also, if we know Jesus, we will endure to the end of our lives. If we know Jesus, we'll work out our salvation with fear and trembling. If we know Jesus, we'll keep on keeping on. If we know Jesus, there will be no deconversion story on our life resume. Only a story of becoming more like Jesus, hour by hour, day by day, year by year, decade by decade. And so for me at, I know, hard to believe for some of you, 53, I look different than when I was 17 or 27 or 37 or 47 or 52. The Jesus life looks like each and every day, each and every day, Holy Spirit working through me, I'm becoming more like him. John says that as a follower of Jesus, praise God, we can know that we have eternal life. Secondly, as a follower of Jesus, praise God, we can know that, that God, like the God of the universe, he hears us and he answers us. Verse 14, this is the confidence we have in approaching God. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we, we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we asked of him. Write this word down. Confidence. Confidence. Uh, I didn't even know this until I studied First John. I'm a little embarrassed. I should have, but I didn't. In the original, in, in the Greek language in our text this morning, um, this word literally means free speech. Isn't that cool? It means free speech. John is telling us that without a doubt, we can have an open and transparent and honest conversation with God. We, we have complete freedom of speech when it comes to talking with the, the God of the universe. He invites that. We have a listening audience. Now that begs the question. How in the world can we approach a holy, righteous, all-knowing all-powerful God who has no beginning and end. Write this word down. Jesus. Remember back in 1 John chapter 2, he says, I am, I am the propitiation for the sins of the world. I'm the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the world. But not only am I the atoning sacrifice, I'm over here as a sacrifice. I, I have died for the sins of the world. But over here, I stand before God the Father. I sit at his right hand, and I'm the advocate. I'm the lawyer. And every time Lee Epstein messes up as a child of God, or every time Lee Epstein comes before the presence of God, the throne of God, the advocate, the lawyer, points back at his act on a cross and says, I did that for him. Full access. Full access. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 14, therefore, since we have such a great high priest, Jesus, who has ascended into, the, into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he didn't sin. Verse 16 is so good. In light of all this, let us then approach God's throne of grace with free speech. With free speech. With confidence. So that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of, our time of need. John tells us that because of Jesus, God is listening to me. Because we know and love Jesus, he hears me. Not only that, but whatever we ask, he listens to and he responds to. But John's promise comes with a qualifier, which I think it's a great qualifier. John says, yeah, you can have anything you want, but it must be in accordance to God's will. John wants us to pray 
boldly, but, but how? According to God's will. Now, who else did that? Because it feels a little, okay, you said I can ask for anything, but man, there's a qualifier. Who else prayed that way? Jesus prayed that way. Remember with the disciples? He, he said, guys, let me teach you how you pray. He says, your kingdom come, your what? Your will be done. So Jesus says, when you pray, you always pray for God's will to be done. Tacking that on on the end is not sort of hedging your bets. It's doing what Jesus told us to do. But not only did Jesus tell us to do that, that's how Jesus prayed. Remember Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane? Great drops of blood pouring down his his forehead. And he, he prayed, Father, not my will be done, but your will be done. And by the way, who better to tell us than John? He hung out with Jesus. He heard Jesus teach this. He saw Jesus model this. And so John says to us, pray confidently, pray boldly, but always do so in accordance with God's will. And if we really think about it, it makes perfect sense that that we would do it this way. I mean, do do you really want our sin-tainted, biased, oftentimes emotional will to be done? Let me give you quickly three reasons why it would be a mistake for us to pray in accordance to our will. And I'll pick on myself. Number one, God always acts with love and sometimes I act with selfishness. I mean, (laughs) do you really want me praying my will? Number two, and this is a biggie, God always knows what is best for me. I often find um, what I thought was best was not. First service, I apologized to Ruth, my wife. She's not in here um, second service. She's here first. And so you say, well, what did you apologize for? Here's what I apologized for. On at least tef- 10 different occasions before I married Ruth, before I even knew her, I prayed for some other woman to be my wife. You know what's scary? Every single time, I thought I was praying my will. You ever done that? You ever, that Algebra 2 class, guys, and you're like, man, she is smoking hot, and she smells good, and I like the way she dresses, and she loves Jesus. Oh, God, give her to me as my wife. It must be, and it doesn't happen. Imagine that. In my case, God knew who I should marry, right? We always pray his will. Number three, number three, God... God's will is is always superior to my own because God sees the big picture and I don't. Within the will of God, there are tremendous things and vast numbers of gifts that he has provided for his children. Please hear this. The will of God includes all that we need and all that we really want. There's nothing we need to pray for outside the will of God. By the way, if you pray for things outside the will of God, those things bring harm and destruction and injury and death. George Mueller. Look it up. He's, he's long dead, but he's really cool. The life he lived. He fed thousands of orphans with food provided in answer to prayer. And he said this, and I love this. He said, prayer is not overcoming God's reluctance. It's laying hold of God's willingness. God wants to fulfill his will in our lives. We just have to lay hold of it in prayer. You remember James, Jesus' brother? You've heard this so many times. He says, Lee, you, you don't have because you don't ask. And then often when you ask, the things you ask for, they're not the things that you need. So my question for us this morning is this. What is the express will of God? that we're not asking for? What is the express will of God that we're not asking for? We tend to get caught up in asking for things that that may or may not be the will of God. Oh God, is it your will that I have a Ferrari? Maybe, maybe not. Oh God, is it your will that I become ridiculously rich and famous. I, maybe, maybe not. But I do know that the salvation of your loved ones and friends is the will of God. I do know that the will of God, Paul says in Thessalonians, is that we should avoid sexual immorality. Are we asking for that? 
Are we praying for holiness? I do know that Jesus desires that his church be unified. That's a good prayer. Are we praying that every day? What I want to do now for the remainder of my time is I want to bring somebody up who has been for some time, for years, has been praying every day for reconciliation and and the restoration of a brother in Christ. Uh, By the way, that is the will of God. He's been praying every day not only for a brother in Christ, but for his own brother. And it gets a little weirder now. He's been praying for his own, his own twin brother. I know. You didn't see that coming, did you? Okay. Is Kevin on the right? Raise your hand if you think Kevin is on the right. Raise your hand. Yeah, that way, over there. Is Kevin on the left? Raise your hand. Okay. You're all wrong. No, no, you're right. You're right. He's, he looks much better looking than his other side of him over there. So. I'll tell him he said that. Yeah. Um, we get to have Kevin two weeks in a row. How awesome is this? Uh, Kev, let me ask you, and um, I know the story. I know it well. You have been um, praying for your brother for years, and uh, God has been doing some amazing stuff. So just kind of set the scene for us, and how did we get to a place where two twins who were incredibly close, who both came to know Jesus, became so far apart, and it became so destructive. I'll let you kind of set the table. Sure. Let us Thank know. you. Hey, good morning, New Heights. And uh, so, yeah, I have a twin brother, and it kind of, we look a little bit alike, don't you think? And it, it sort of freaks people out. It even freaked my kids out when they were little. They would see my brother and see me, and they go, they look at me and go, Daddy? And they go, Other Daddy. <laughs> You know, they're just confused. And so, uh, but it's a lot of fun. And so growing up, we were best friends. And and if you know my story, one of the most incredible, it's really miraculous. uh, We both came to Jesus together. It's an incredible, really miraculous story. We were picked up out of the darkness and just put into the kingdom of God in one day. Really incredible. And and we also got called into full-time ministry. And so his ministry calling is to soldiers and to veterans. Uh, it's a it's a hard ministry. He's an active duty chaplain in the U.S. Army. He has been for about 15 years. And uh, th- something, though, that has that been a real challenge in, in doing that type of work is he's been deployed overseas four different times to Afghanistan and to Iraq. And so he's come back and just really struggled, uh, really struggled with PTSD and also really struggled in his marriage and, and that's been really tough. And, and in recent years, that has just kind of spilled over into my, my whole family. And, and it's really impacted our relationship to the point where we had a major falling out about three years ago. And it got really hard and really hurtful. And, and he said, and by the way, I have permission to share this story. I should say that. Uh, but just some really hurtful things, really hurtful things were said. And, and basically to the point where I haven't, I didn't hardly speak to him for three years. And he wouldn't, re- he wouldn't return your calls. Yeah, no, and, and when he did, it was bad. And, and so just a lot of heartache, just a lot of grief. So uh, as you're talking about prayer, Lee, uh, you know, some of the things, this, this is like a school of prayer when you're in a situation like this, and especially learning a lot about what forgiveness prayer looks like. Just, just praying forgiveness every single day when the burden, the, the hurt comes up. It's just like, no, I release him to you. I forgive him. And not only do, am I going to forgive him, but well, Lord, I want to bless him. Even though I don't feel like that, I just want to bless him, pray for your blessing in his, in his life. And something else I've also just been learning about prayer, and, and we teach this, uh, is that there is power in agreement right? Like what Jesus said, we're two or more gathered in my name. I'm there. And, and so I take that really seriously. So I'm like, man, I just need to just get as many people praying as possible because this relationship looks impossible to reconcile. So getting, getting Lee and Jim and the elders and church staff praying, uh, getting my family praying, getting our community group praying, getting college students praying. I mean, there are people all over this room, literally, who have prayed for my brother uh, over the last years. And so let me let me ask you kind of the obvious question because I, I think I can speak for Jim as well. You would come to us and share with us, and it just felt impossible. Like I remember you getting discouraged, but I probably felt more discouraged than you did. And so after all, and I know I know firsthand how much you prayed, how you bought, got the body to pray. So what 
what happened? I mean, obviously he's giving you permission, so something cool has happened. What happened? Yeah. So, so like Lee said this morning, when we pray for things that are God's will, we can have confidence that God hears us and he's moving. So obviously reconciliation and unity and repairing our relationships, it's God's will. So when we, when we pray, even though it looks dismal on the surface, God is working below the surface. And a lot of times he's working in circumstances that we can't see, and that takes time to work out. So he's been working in my brother's life over the, over the, the past few years. And just recently, about three months ago, I felt like the Lord nudged me and said, you need to reach out to him. He's in a really bad, dark place. Reach out to him. So I did. And, and he said, Kevin, I want to see you. I want you to come out here, fly out to Washington. That's where he's stationed. He's like, I want to see you. We had a big birthday that was happening. And he's like, I don't want to, I don't want to be alone on my birthday. Can you come? And, and I was like, okay, I'm going to go. And I was nervous, like really nervous. This is like, you know, Jacob and Esau meeting each other. You know, I'm like, <laughs> this could go sideways. Well, you were like, you didn't, I don't know if you feared for your life, but you were like, Lee, if I don't come back, I, yeah, go was, to the authorities. I was nervous, and we were going up to this cabin out in the mountains, yeah. no cell phone. Yeah. Seriously. Uh, so, so I flew in, and he picked me up, and, and we're driving up into the mountains, and, I, and it's awkward. But we get there, and you guys, the, the first, very first night, we start talking. And at a certain point in the conversation, you've experienced this, hopefully. It's like the Holy Spirit just takes the lead. And all of a sudden, you're like, I'm saying things. Things are, th- are coming out of my mouth that I wouldn't say and I'm like I almost like I can't believe I'm saying these things and what was amazing is he was receiving them like just soft and broken and repentant and just receiving them and I was just like this is an act of God and literally we just talked and and I literally felt this at one point like people are praying right now it's like, I feel prayers. People are praying right now. And, and it just moved to this place where at a certain point in the night, we're like hugging each other, crying. And at the end of the night, we're looking each other in the eyes, and, he, and we just said, I forgive you. Wow. And I commit to, to honoring you and building a new relationship. And so I was just like, praise God. God, this is the, the prayers of many, God answering. And I got my brother back. And, and so absolutely Woo, amazing. Clap. Praise God. Amen. Thank you, bro. Thank you. Well, before I pray for Kevin's brother, there's a couple of things that Kev um, brought up that were really, really good. And I, I think it's a great model for all of us in, the, in this room. Um, the question I want to ask you is what about, what about you? What about that, that relationship that you have that has gone south? that needs reconciliation or that family member who needs Jesus or that friend that's struggling with addiction. And, and what I want to pull out from what Kevin said was you kind of saw a pattern there. The first thing he did was he, he prayed. He really did. Secondly, he brought the body of Christ into this. So as he said, there's power in agreement. And, and thirdly, I thought this was, was really cool. He didn't give up. And you're not hearing all the story. You don't have time for it. But he kept pressing into a brother who kept um, verbally rejecting him or just not returning his calls or his emails or anything. And he still kept pressing in. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to encourage you here. We're going to have a baptism here. And then after that baptism, we're going to continue to worship. And during that worship time, which we kind of call our ministry time, um, the prayer team will come up. There'll be an opportunity to take communion. Tim will talk more about that. But I'm going to encourage you during that ministry time to find somebody to pray with. Maybe they're, they're praying for you in a broken relationship. Maybe you're struggling with forgiveness. Maybe it's somebody else. Maybe it's you got a son or daughter who um, is away from Jesus. And you just, as Kevin said, you want to pray in agreement or two or more gathered. Um, it is God's will that we forgive. It's God's will that people come to know Jesus. It's God's will that reconciliation takes place. And so the devil is telling you, don't do it. Put it off. Or you've been done wrong. Jesus is telling you, get this right. Get this. Life is too short. So um, I think Bruce is ready to go. Bruce, come on up. <laughs> 